Dear Father in heaven, we ask that your spirit would touch our hearts because it's not really, as the scripture says, not it's not by might, it's not my power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And Lord, we want to see your hand in our lives. We want to be able to be used by you and we want to know your ways. And so we ask, Lord, that you would teach us tonight and that you would help us to rest more calmly in your hand. This we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've got to get uh, connected up here, and I think I may be. Uh, let's see here. Charles, I think we're ready, and it looks like you've got it there. Yeah, there we go. Okay. You know, as we look at Christ now, is there any, can you see that? Okay, folks. I need a little bit of light cut off. He's Charles is getting it. There we go. Does that help? Okay. Well, <clears throat> when you think about <clears throat> a sinless life, God is calling you and I to be without sin. And now that just seems almost impossible. I mean, really, you think about it. It's just like, and especially if you get, as the older you get, the more you realize what a mess we are. You know, what a mess I am, okay? And you realize it's only by the grace of God that any of us will make it. You know, and of course, ultimately, the Lord's tried to teach us to trust in him. And so as this statement says, Christ was the only sin one, sinless one who ever dwelt on earth. Yet for nearly 30 years, he lived among the wicked inhabitants of Nazareth. This fact is a rebuke to those who think themselves dependent upon place or fortune or prosperity in order to live a blameless life. Temptation, poverty, adversity is the very discipline that is needed to develop purity and firmness. So, you know, my my nephew works with me in my business. I, I'm a heating and air conditioning contractor. And uh, we get ourselves into situations sometimes that they are just turned out to be sort of upside down, okay? For instance, like just recently, uh, I had a, a contractor in Jefferson who contacted me and he said, Hey, I have bid on these government housing on remodeling four of them. And he said, I was wondering if you could send me a bid. So I sent him a bid and, uh, and he called me and talked to me and he explained to me, he says, you know, when I took this job, he said, I didn't talk to anybody. And he said, I, I actually made a decision. I mean, I actually estimated for the AC contracting work. I estimated fourteen thousand dollars, fourteen thousand one hundred. Okay, and so he told me. He says uh, my my highest bid was eighteen thousand. I had another guy for seventeen thousand, and of course, if, if you played my bid all out, it would have been about nineteen thousand. Okay, okay. So he told me. He says the problem I have is that I, he said I really messed up because he said I should have talked to somebody before I made this bid. So he. <laughs> I had already gone through and I would figured out how much it would cost me, you know, for the materials and everything. And so when he told me 1410, I says, uh, I think we can maybe do it, but it's going to be tight. Okay. And so I, I agreed to help him. Okay. So he, Joe, so I agreed to do it for what he, and I says, can you make it at least 15,000? He says, okay. He says, I can do that. He says, it was really my stupid mistake. He said, and it's really my fault. It's not anybody else's fault. But he said, and so I said, okay, yeah, I, I, I will do my best to help you. Okay. So we get into this and, um, and Joseph and I, we're working away and we're kind of, it's like, we're doing community service work here. <laughs> and, uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, and, and <laughs> it, it was kind of a joke for us for the first few days, you know, everything is kind of going along and, and the very first day we get out there with equipment they sent us the wrong, <laughs> they sent us the wrong filter bases and they sent us a few other things that were wrong. And, and we had a window of opportunity before the rain came and I needed that equipment that day. So I had to go and drive to Shreveport <laughs> that very day and pick up the right material. Anyway, and I was telling Joseph, I said, well, you know, the Lord wants men who have been thwarted. They have been men who have met with challenges 
And the Lord, he can, he can, he's using these things to polish us. He says, yeah, but can't he give us a break? <laughs> well, my wife told me, I, many times this has happened to me, where they send me the wrong equipment or something like that. My wife, I've told this to my wife. She says, that's, not, that's just normal for you, she says. <laughs> but the comforting part about it is, is that God is in control. And God is polishing us. God is preparing us. So you see here, it says, temptation, poverty, adversity is the very discipline that is needed to develop purity and firmness. You know, folks, if you're looking for an easy street, then you better get out of Christianity. Because Christianity is not about easy street. In fact, Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says, if you're going to reign with me, or if you're going to reign with Christ, he says you're going to have to suffer with him. I think it's 17, Romans 8, 17. If you want to take a moment and look that verse up, you can. Romans 8, 17. So don't be surprised when everything goes wrong. Don't be surprised when it seems like all hell breaks out on you, okay? Because, because we're even told in, in the Zara of Ages, she says that, Christ did not come to win this victory without obstruction. In other words, he was going to have flack or he was going to have difficulties. And he he's the king of the universe, the creator. And so if he, he knew he was going to have difficulties, well, don't be surprised when you run into him either. You know, someone want to read that verse for us, Romans 8, 17? I believe it is. That's it. Yes. And so, just remember, God is preparing you to stand with him on his throne. Folks, we don't really realize the awesome privilege that God has in store for us as laborers together with him. God has, God has a, a reserved a special place for us. We're told in the Spirit of Prophecy, that because of the fall and because of Jesus adopting humanity, we have been brought into a closer relationship with him than even the angels can know. And of course, you, if you look at Psalm 139, <laughs> I'm not going to take right now the time to read it, but if you look at Psalm 139, he says, I know when you sit down. I know when you rise. I know before you even speak a word on your tongue. You see, he says, I know all about you. And, and the scripture goes on to say, such knowledge, it's just, just too wonderful for me. I can't even, I can't even comprehend it. And, and of course, as you go on, he even says, he says, the thoughts I think about you, they are more than the grains of sand. Now, folks, that is a lot. I've, I've, I've thought about that and I've thought, that really means that Jesus has been thinking about us long before the world was created. Because there is so much sand that it, it's, there's more sand than there have been days, I'm sure, you know. And so God has been thinking about us for a long time. And he's anxious for us to fall in love with him. I don't know if fall is the word for it. He's anxious for us to grow into love with him. To where our love for him is so strong that hell cannot separate us from him. And so we shouldn't be surprised if we end up with difficulties. You see, for 4,000 years, the race has been decreasing in physical strength and mental power and in moral worth, and Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Now that is just amazing. You know, when Satan... When Satan saw that Christ came to this world, he could not comprehend such love. It was just, it blew his mind as the expression would go. I mean, he just could not comprehend it. Only thus could Jesus rescue man from the lowest depths of his degradation. And so Jesus had to accept our humanity and our weakened condition. 
Well, see, the tempter seeks to inspire Christ with his own sentiments. He comes to him. You remember there in the Matthew chapter 4, there in the wilderness, and Jesus is, Adrian, now you think you're hungry. And I agree with you. I'm hungry too because I didn't have any lunch today. And my breakfast was pretty slim. I was, in a sense, I'm fasting with you, okay? <laughs> but Christ hadn't eaten for how many days, folks? 40 days. 40 days. And so the tempter came to Christ with his own sentiments. This was his own feelings, his own ideas, his own suggestions. If you be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God. Now, you're gonna, I want to stop and just inject the fact that if you look and if you read this whole story closely in the Desire of Ages, you find out what Christ, I mean, what Satan is trying to insinuate to him is that you don't really look like the one you think you are. Your father wouldn't allow you to get in such condition. You know? You don't look favored of heaven and you certainly don't look like the Son of God. So let's go on and read. The words are, they rankle with bitterness and in, in Jesus' mind. In the tones of his voice is an expression of utter incredulity. Would God treat his own son thus? Would he leave him in the desert with wild beasts, without food, without companions, without comfort? He insinuates that God never meant his son to be in such a state as this. If thou be the son of God, show thy power by relieving thyself of this pressing hunger. Command that this stone be made bread. That wouldn't be a temptation for me or you because we don't have that power. But Christ had that power. He had that power. And you see what Satan is trying to do? He's trying to get him to side with him to think he's got to prove something. You see? But Jesus didn't need to prove a thing, did he? The words from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew three seventeen. You remember what, when, when this was spoken at? At the baptism, that's correct. They were still sounding in the ears of Satan. And he was determined to make Christ disbelieve this testimony. He was trying to get Jesus to look at his circumstances. And that's what he does with us. He's all the time trying to get us, our attention diverted off of Christ. Off of his word, off of his promises, and onto our circumstances. You know, if God really loves you, why are you sick? Why, why are you experiencing all these difficulties? Why are you having all this trouble? Why is everything going wrong for you? <laughs> now, of course, he has, a, he has all kinds of ways of working to try to get us off. That's just, that's just one side of it, of course. The other side of it, of course, is trying to get us to think things like, wow, you're the coolest dude. You know, flattery. That's what he did with Eve. You know, Ellen White says that Satan spoke suggestions or thoughts to her that only her husband should have said. So he has all kinds of tricks in his bag, and you and I are not capable of fighting those without the aid of Christ. But with Christ, all things are possible. So we, we go on here, and so... The ears, this is still sounding in Satan's ears. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he's, he's determined to make Christ disbelieve this testimony. The word of God was Christ's assurance. Now just stop and think for a minute what that said. The word of God was Christ's assurance of his divine mission. How many of you ever thought or believed that Christ depended upon the Bible to know who he was. I see some of you. But when I finally absorbed this thought, I thought, wow, if Jesus had to depend upon the scriptures to know who he was, then I have to depend upon the scriptures to know who I am. If Jesus needed the word of God to know his divine mission, how much more I need the word of God to know my divine mission. And so Satan was constantly working here to try to get Jesus to disbelieve what the word declared. The father had, had spoken clearly, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so we go on and it says, 
He had come to live as a man among men, and it was the word that declared his connection with heaven. Those two boys were my grandchildren. They're identical twins. <laughs> That's my oldest daughter's twins. Now, it was Satan's purpose to cause him to doubt that word. If Christ's confidence in God could be shaken, Satan knew that the victory in the whole controversy would be his. He could overcome Jesus. He had hoped that under the force of despondency and extreme hunger, Christ would lose faith in his Father and work a miracle in his own behalf. Had he done this, the plan of salvation would have been broken up. So, it was at the time of greatest weakness that Christ was assailed by the fiercest temptations. We can all identify with this poor little guy. He's, he's one of my uh, cousins, I think, or <laughs> I don't know. One of, one of my members of my family, my sister gave a picture, and I thought, well, that's the appropriate picture for this particular slide. <laughs> you know, is it's when we are down that Satan comes and pounces on us. You know? It says, thus Satan thought to prevail. By his policy, he had gained this victory over man. And when strength failed and the willpower weakened and faith ceased to repose in God, then those who had stood long and valiantly for the right were overcome. And think about, let's think about some of those people that were overcome. Moses was wearied with 40 years of wandering of Israel when for the moment his faith let go its hold upon infinite power. He failed just upon the borders of the promised land. So with Elijah, who had stood undaunted before King Ahab, who had faced the whole nation of Israel with 450 prophets of Baal at their head. And after that terrible day upon Carmel, when the false prophets had been slain and the people had declared their allegiance to God, Elijah fled for his life before the threats of the idolatrous Jezebel. He didn't stop to talk about God, or to talk with God about this. He just ran. He just ran. And you think about all those men. All those men were mighty men of God, used of God in mighty ways. And thus Satan has taken advantage of the weakness of humanity and he still is working in the same way. Whenever one is encompassed with clouds, perplexed by circumstances, or afflicted by poverty or distress, Satan is at hand to tempt us and to annoy us. He attacks our weak points of character. And we've all got them. You know, we've all got them. He seeks to shake our confidence in God who suffers such a condition of things to exist. I like my nephew. Can he give us a break? You know? <laughs> he is working on giving us a break. A break that will last for eternity. In the meantime, we need to hang on. <laughs> we are tempted to distrust God, to question his love. Often the tempter comes to us as he came to Christ, arraying before us our weaknesses and our infirmities. He hopes to discourage the soul and to break our hold on God. And then he is sure of his prey. If we would meet him as Jesus did, we should escape many a defeat. By parleying with the enemy, we give him an advantage. That's one of my best friends. <laughs> He's our cook at the school this year. So long as we are united to him by faith, Sin has no more dominion over us. In other words, by faith, you recognize that God has chosen you. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Don't let go of that promise, folks. You must hold on to the word of God who assures you who you are. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ. That we may attain to perfection of character. You see, that little guy was happy there in the lap of, of somebody he, he could trust, somebody he loved. And so can be with us. 
as we learn to rest in his love, we too can be happy, even though the heavens fall. Okay. You remember when, when Jesus was there in the garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, is there any other way? But no, there wasn't any other way. It was the only way the Father could save us. And the Father did send him some comfort. He sent him the angel next to his presence. It, it filled that position that Satan fell from. And he encouraged him. And he says, you will redeem many souls. Because of your sacrifice, you will be able to bring many sons to glory. And so the pressure, the, the, the discouragement, or you might say, or the stress didn't leave Christ, but the cloud lifted. He, he could go through with his sacrifice knowing that many sons would be brought to glory and so and so how was this accomplished how did christ win he shot he has showed us how he did it by what means did he overcome in this conflict with satan he did it by the word of god only by the word could he resist temptation it is written he said and unto us are given exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 2 Peter 1.4 So that's why Psalmist tells us, the Bible makes it clear, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, when the devil comes and tempts you, you have to have truth to, to counteract his lies. And so he says, Fear thou not, because I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to him be glory and dominion and power forever and ever. Jude 24. So God has given us many promises in which we can lay a hold of to help us in our weaknesses and in our day of temptation, in our trials. And we must cultivate hiding these promises in our heart so that when Satan comes to us, we have something that we can fall back on and we can depend upon. Because God is not a liar that he should lie. His word will not fail us. Those flowers there, by the way, I found those in Norway. <laughs> and I thought they were beautiful. And you know, that's what God wants to make each one of us. He wants to make each of us a beautiful flower to reflect his love and his character. That was from our garden there at Uchi Pines. <laughs> you know, it's such a beautiful fruit, isn't it? Eggplant. I don't really care for it but I like it. <laughs> I, I think it's beautiful. It is a pretty, it's a pretty plant and, in the, and the fruit is beautiful, but I don't get really excited about eating it. <laughs> there are some ways though I can, I can handle it. You know, Every promise in God's word is ours. By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God are we to live. When assailed by temptation, look not to circumstances or to the weakness of self but to the power of the word. All its strength is yours. Thy word, says the psalmist, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. By the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Psalm 119, 11 and Psalm 17, 4. So the word is our source of comfort, our source of strength. But notice this statement here. This is a warning to us who have a lot of responsibilities. If the rush of work is allowed to drive us from our purpose of seeking the Lord daily, we shall make the greatest mistakes. We shall incur losses for the Lord's not with us. We've closed the door so that he cannot find access to our souls. But if we pray even when our hands are employed, the Savior's ears is open to hear our petitions. If we are determined not to be separated from the source of our strength, Jesus will be just as determined to be at our right hand to help us that we may not be put to shame before our enemies. I like that. If we are determined, 
he will be just as determined to be at our right hand. The grace of Christ can accomplish for us that which all our efforts will fail to do. Those who love and fear God may be surrounded with a multitude of cares and yet not falter or make crooked paths for their feet. God takes care of you in the place where it is your duty to be. You know, and folks, that is so true. You know, my plans all went through the window today. <laughs> but I, I knew that God was still on the throne. And I knew that somehow he was going to work this out. Now, I, I had a message for you tonight, and it was a little bit different than this one. But I, I tried my best to, to fulfill Adrian's request. He said, I really would like PowerPoint. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I'll try. Well, I was having all kinds of trouble. First of all, my, my iPad is old. My first one, the one we're using here is old. It's an iPad 2. It's, it's nine years old. And, uh, and I didn't know if I could figure out how to connect it with my, with my new iPad, my newer iPad. This one's three years old, and I just didn't know if, I would, if it worked. And I got online, and I tried to make it work. Charles, he told me what to do, and I, I got there, and I could not make it work. So finally, Charles invited me to come up last Sunday, and I really, I didn't really want to travel up here because I couldn't really spare the time unless I had to. So I contacted my pastor because I got this iPad from him. And I said, is there any way you can help me? I'm trying to make Keynote work. And so he says, I can in a couple of hours. So last Sunday, I went over to his house. And within 10 minutes, he had it figured out for me. And I was so thankful. And so I thought, all right, now I've got it to where I can make the two work. And so, but I've been so busy, I hadn't been able to put the message that I wanted to share with you tonight. I hadn't been able to put it on PowerPoint. So, and then, of course, my plan was to do it this morning. And my, all that plan fell through. <laughs> and I thought, and I was, the last call I had was helping an, a, a family, Christian family. And he was so apologetic to me. He just felt so bad because he knew I needed to be doing some other things. But he really needed that room working. And so he really needed my help. And I told him, I said, oh, it's okay. I said, God is still in control. It'll all work out somehow, some way. And so I wasn't even for sure if I was going to make it late. I, I text Charles and tell him, I said, hey, I'm going, to, I, I'm going to probably be late. And I went home and I changed clothes and grabbed my stuff and got in the car and I headed here. And I actually got here early, didn't I, Charles? Here. Yeah. <laughs> I got here at 520. And so the Lord blessed. I got here in good time. And, uh, and then while I was here, I opened up my iPad and I said, well, I'm going to look through my old PowerPoints and see if I have something I can use. <laughs> And sure enough, just what I needed was here. And so I was so thankful, Adrian, I got to fulfill your request. And the Lord was still right on time. And so I think that the Lord's trying to teach us, folks, to trust him. He wants us to learn to trust him. You know, there's a statement that says, a life of constant dependence upon the Savior is a life of holiness. And there's another statement in Desire of Ages that says the reason why we don't see more manifestations of the Holy Spirit is because we want to manage ourselves. We want to be in control. And when it doesn't go our way, you know what we do? We get upset. We get uptight. We get stressed. <laughs> Sometimes we get angry, you know? But God's telling us, let me be in charge. Let me be in control. Let me handle this. Years ago, I heard this little saying, and it went like this. I wished I had the whole thing. All I can remember was, this thing is from me. <laughs> and then that's probably enough said right there. We have to realize that around every one of us, there is like a tent or a, a barrier that God puts there. And the only way Satan can get through that barrier is if we open the door and let him in, or if... God permits him to come in like he did with Job. You remember? God gave Job permission to enter that barrier. You remember what Satan told? He says, I can't touch him because you, you've got a hedge around him. You know? Well, that's true. God has a hedge around each one of us. And he, Satan can't do anything more than what, than what God allows. 
But if you and I break down the hedge, then we're the ones that are responsible. Still, nevertheless, he still is at bay to some degree. Ultimately, he has to give an account to God. But we can open up Satan's uh, temptations. For instance, like <clears throat> if we do things that we know are going to harm us, if we get in our car and we drive down the road 100 miles an hour, well, we have opened up the gate for Satan to work. You know, if we choose to do things that destroy our health, we can't blame God that we got sick. We have to recognize that you and I have a part to play. Our part is to cooperate with heaven. We are laborers together with God. God has a hedge around us, but either God can let Satan in or either we can let Satan in. But if we will realize that it is in our power to say no to Satan, then we can do that. I remember years ago, there was a, a friend of ours and she wrote this little song. And, and the little song went like to say, say no. It was, just, it was for children. And, it, and I don't remember all of it, but it said, no, no, Mr. Satan, don't you listen. And it went on like that. And, it, and, it, and, it, and the whole little song told about us saying no to Satan's temptations. And it's true. You and I have that responsibility today. We must say no, and we can only do it through the power of the word. And, you know, we're talking about reformation. We're talking about revival. We're talking about reaching out to our community. Folks, before we can actually accomplish the outreach that we'd like, we must be experiencing the power. Jesus said, love your neighbors as you love yourself. You see? And so God's wanting you and I to experience this power so that he can use us to reach our community. So now back to this slide. It says, those who love and fear God may be surrounded with a multitude of cares and yet not falter or make crooked paths for their feet. God takes care of you in the place where it is your duty to be. But be sure, as often as possible, to go where prayer is wont to be made. This was actually some counsels that was written to a physician. And, and the physician, of course, sometimes th things come, <laughs> you don't just say, hey, wait a second, uh, sir, I know you're dying, but I got to go spend an hour with the Lord in prayer. You know, <laughs> uh, it don't quite work that way. Someone's needing help and you've got the responsibility to help them. You'll be praying as you go. Just like when Nehemiah was there before the king and the king said, what is ailing you? And the Bible said, well, he didn't quite say it like that, but you know, what's troubling you? And he, the Bible says, Nehemiah shot up a prayer to heaven. And so there are times when that's the best we can do. But what did she say here? But be sure as often as possible to go where prayer is want to be made. You see, you and I need to place ourselves in the best condition or the best surroundings we can. So take time for prayer. Take time for devotions. Take time to spend with God. Don't think that God is going to bless you if you're always running and neglecting prayer. You know? Yeah, you might be praying under your, as you, in your thoughts as you go, but that's not sufficient. You know, there were times when Jesus had to go and get special help. For instance, like the time of Mount Transfiguration. If you'll read closely, she says he needed a fresh hold of his divinity. Now that encouraged me when I read that. Because if Jesus needed a fresh hold on his divinity, you and I need a fresh hold on our connection with God. And we need it as often as we can get it. So it goes on to say, the Savior says, thou hast a few names in Sardius, Sardius which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Revelation 3, 4. These souls overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And that's where our strength lies as we take time to contemplate the sacrifice of Christ for us. As we take time to meditate upon his life and his love for us. I chose this picture of my grandson because the simplicity of a child the innocency of a child looking up to you, asking for something, you know? Can you imagine someone, one of your children, your grandchildren asking you for something? Well, you're going to listen. Yeah. 
says, amid, amid moral pollution that prevailed on every hand, they held fast their integrity. And why? They were partakers of the divine nature. And thus they escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. They became rich in faith, heirs to an inheritance of more value than the gold of Ophir. Only a life of constant dependence upon the Savior is a life of holiness. Councils on Health, 424, paragraph 1. Isn't that beautiful? That luscious little green tender plant right there in the mulch. And so it is with us. God says to each one of us, you are beautiful. But it's only in meekness and lowliness that we experience this beauty. You notice what it says. Meekness and lowliness are the conditions of success and victory. You see, we, we want to be successful in reaching our, our community. But the only way it's going to happen is if we realize, not I, but Christ. It's not my talents. It's not my strength. It's not my wisdom. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. His love. His self-sacrifice. His goodness. I like that Romans 2, 4 says, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. A crown of glory awaits those who bow at the foot of the cross. Prophets and Kings, page 590. It was by cherishing a humble, teachable spirit that these men gained the experience that enabled them to go out as workers into the harvest field. That's, he's referring here to the disciples. Their example presents to Christians a lesson of great value. There are many who make but little progress in the divine life because they are too self-sufficient to occupy the position of learners. They are content with a superficial knowledge of God's word. They do not wish to change their faith or to practice or, or their practices and hence make no effort to obtain greater light. So they're content with a form of godliness. That's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1. They have a form of godliness. And that's also a part of the problem with foolish virgins, five foolish virgins. They liked being in the church. They liked the Christian atmosphere. They, they liked the idea of going to heaven. But they were not willing to give all. They were too content to be passive. They weren't willing to sacrifice. They weren't willing to take up the cross and make it happen. You see... If we are going to follow Christ, we're going to have to do what he said. And that is, if you're going to come after me, take up your cross and follow me. Remember, we start out with a verse, that verse there in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. If we plan on reigning with him, we need to plan on suffering with him. So here it says, it says, <clears throat> they are content with a superficial knowledge of God's word. They're not hiding the word of God in their hearts. They're not studying it, feeding on it, eating it. They do not wish to change their faith or their practice, and hence they make no effort to obtain greater light. Acts of the Apostles, page 283, paragraph 2. In the apostles of our Lord, there was nothing to bring glory to themselves. It was evident that the success of their labors was due only to God. The lives of these men, the characters they developed, the mighty works that God wrought through them, are a testimony to what he will do for all who are teachable and obedient. Teachable and obedient. That's what meekness, by the way, means. It means teachableness. Moses was the meekest man on earth because he was the most teachable man on the earth. Now, before his fall, Peter was always speaking unadvisedly from the impulse of the moment. <laughs> you've heard the old saying open mouth and insert foot yeah well that was Peter he would speak before he thought he was always ready to correct others he was very self confident he was ready to express his mind before he even had a clear comprehension of himself or of what he had to say but the converted Peter was very different he retained his former fervor but the grace of Christ regulated his zeal he was no longer impetuous, self-confident, and self-exalted, but
but he was calm, self-possessed, and teachable. He could then feed the lambs as well as the sheep of Christ's flock. And that's what, that's what God wanting to do for us. He wants to convert us. <laughs> he wants there to be a death to self so that we no longer trust in ourselves. We're no longer self-confident. Our confidence is like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, Jesus is my wisdom. He is my righteousness. He is my sanctification. He is my redemption. And then 31, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. You see, we have nothing to glory in of ourselves. Our only glory is the power of Christ, his self-sacrifice, his humility, his love for the lost race. It was at that point he could feed the lambs. And so as we look forward to reaching out in our community, it's when we thus obtain the understanding. When it's not just a head knowledge, but it's in our heart that we can do nothing without him. John 15, 7, For I am the vine and you are the branch. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And that's a hard lesson for us to learn. But it's a lesson that God is wanting to teach us. Without me, you can do nothing. So Moses, Moses was the greatest man who ever stood as a leader of the people of God. He was greatly honored by God, not for the experience which he had gained in the Egyptian court, but because he was the meekest of men. God talked with him face to face as a man talks with a friend. And if men desire to be honored by God, let them be humble. Those who carry forward God's work should be distinguished from all others by their humility. So, true Christianity is going to be like Jesus, who thought it not a thing to be grasped to be on an equality with God, but humbled himself to become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Of the man who is noted for his meekness, Christ says, he can be trusted. Through him I can reveal myself to the world. He will not weave into the web any threads of selfishness. I will manifest myself to him as I do not to the world. Manuscript 165, 1899, or 1 BC, 1113, paragraph 4. That was a lamb, I, or yeah, a sheep that I found in Norway. And I thought it was kind of neat. And you see this picture here, that's, that's a picture there in, uh, in Norway. And God has mountains for us to climb. He has heights for us to reach that we don't even have a clue about. He has a, a place for us that, I like that song, it says, how's it go? Do you know what I'm talking about? Place my feet, you raise me up. Well, that one too, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there's, a, there's another song that I think of, it, uh, and I heard it just recently. But anyway, God is planning on putting your feet on higher ground. And he wants to use you in a mighty way. But before he can do it, what has, what has to happen? We have to be converted. Self has to be laid in the dust. There's a statement in Faith and Works, and it says, What is righteousness by faith? What is it? It's the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is impossible for man to do for himself. So as God is working on laying your glory in the dust, don't get upset. He's polishing you. He's getting you ready for service. We must learn to trust him and let him be God. Let him manage us, not us manage ourselves. <clears throat> 